I'm here with uh, Connor, who is another worker here and member or uh, member of the Amazon Labor Union. You know, I've been talking to the folks. Uh, I just wanted to get your initial reaction because it, to me, it's kind of scandalous that Amazon had the warehouse open during a tornado. Yeah. You know, there's all this nonsense of oh, well, tornadoes could happen. You don't know the trajectory, and there wasn't that much warning. I mean, there's been plenty of reporting that there was plenty of warning of this tornado and tragically one of the workers who died there's a text message he sent to his uh, wife saying they won't let me leave uh, you guys aren't strangers to that you were made to work during Hurricane Ida during snowstorms uh, what's your reaction to I mean what honestly sounds kind of scandalous I mean it's anybody who's worked here long enough when there's been hazardous weather knows that they never close this building doesn't matter how bad the weather is. So I've driven to work in blizzards where I can't even see out my front window. Um, I, like in August, we had those two hurricanes back to back, and um, I wasn't affected, thankfully. But there are people I know who, you know, they lost everything in that storm, and they still had to come to work the next day through these flooded roads. I, you know, I know a manager who whose car was flooded and he couldn't even get to work. Uh, but they still made everybody come in. Um, and it's just, it's part of their whole, like, they, we can never shut down, especially not during peak. They got to make money, uh, and it doesn't really matter what we have to say about it. We have no power in that. Peaks, the holidays? Yes. And let me ask you, uh, right now there's been a lot of focus put back on the fact that they're trying to re-implement a phone ban mm -hmm. where workers can't have their phones. Kind of important to have your phones to get updates on tornadoes, hurricanes, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of talk about... It seems like they've been trying to loosen COVID restrictions and re-implement pre-pandemic things like a phone ban. Yeah, so yeah, before COVID, uh, you couldn't have your cell phone in the building. You had to leave it in your car or in a locker. Um, and, you know, during the pandemic, uh, there's a lot of people, number one, the turnover is so high here. That there's people who, who work here with their phones and they don't even know what it's like to not have their phone in there. Yeah, so this whole pandemic, we've had our phones and you know, we still broke records in this building. We're like the, the top performing building in the network and uh, across Amazon, you know, Amazon is still outperforming expectations. You know, the stock price is still going up. And the thing is, they, they would like this to be like a prison. You, you know, you come in and you're pretty much disconnected from the outside world. Um, but, you know, people are really accustomed now to the fact that they can have their phones, they can connect with their families on the outside. If there's an emergency, they have their phone with them. Um, and, you know, they, they don't have to be completely disconnected from everybody for their 10 or 12 hour shift. And especially in the case of the hurricane, you know, there were workers who were in that building who didn't get the notification on their phone that they were in the path of the, I'm sorry, in the tornado. They didn't get the notification that they were, you know, at risk of being in the path of tornado. So. Um, it's a big part of the reason that we are fighting to keep our cell phones because everybody agrees that it's completely ridiculous to expect us to, to leave them outside because we've proven that, you know, we had them in the building didn't, you know, the operations didn't shut down. We still broke records. The, the company still functions. And also, I mean, I've had workers just sending me screenshots on a daily basis, COVID alert, COVID alert, another worker's positive, another worker's positive. So like, if you don't have your phones, how are you supposed to know? What is the COVID situation? How many alerts are coming a day with your coworkers testing positive to then find out, oh, I know Amazon doesn't tell you specifically who they are, but um, don't you need to know during a pandemic, now there's a new variant spreading, uh, how many positive cases there are per day here? Yeah, so that's a big part. That's really the only way we get notified of COVID cases uh, is through notifications on the app. And to be honest, they're not even that clear. It's really hard to tell sometimes how many cases they're reporting because um, they don't give us a running total of how many cases are in the building. They don't tell us how many cases there have been, how many people have died, uh, because, you know, if they told us that, it would allow workers to make an accurate risk assessment of whether or not it was safe for them to come into work. So it's another scandal. It came out that they hid 20,000 cases during the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, our phones are really the only way that we can get those notifications. And I don't really know how we're going to, you know, get those notifications. I mean, we'll, we'll, we can access them on the outside, but we, we really need up-to-date information to really know if it's the working conditions in there are safe. Can you kind of tell the audience just, I think they look at the Starbucks workers that were just successful, which they deserve a lot of credit. Uh, in Buffalo, they formed the first Starbucks union. Um, and they don't really get the differences. I mean, Starbucks in Buffalo, you know, is uh, three stores. This is a mag massive warehouse with over 7,000 uh, workers, and Amazon has like a 150% turnover rate. So you could get 
a ton of people to sign cards, yes, pro-union, and drop off the cards at the National Labor Relations Board, which you guys did in November, but Amazon's firing so many of the workers that end up signing yes that the NLRB said, no, there's not enough current workers here. Can you kind of talk about what you guys are up against? Because you're getting people to sign the cards that they're interested in a union, yet they're firing so many workers. Yeah, I mean, well... Jeff Bezos, 20 years ago, he built Amazon to be that way intentionally. He built it to be a big middle finger to labor law. Uh, the 150 percent turnover is it's there exactly so that you can't organize the workers so that we're at any given time. We're fungible, we're replaceable, we're very weak and divided. We have no power. And, uh, you know, when you come in and you try to get cards signed, you have to get them signed faster than people quit or get fired. And so in this building, for instance, with 6,000 workers, 150 percent turnover, that means in a year they'll churn through 10,000 people. Um, and that re makes it really, really hard for us to, uh, for anybody really to hit that 30 percent threshold that the board needs um, for a showing of interest. Uh, but what's interesting with the board is that um, really when you're, petitioning to have a union election, all you need to do for them is demonstrate that there is interest here because they want to see you like when they uh, when they come and hold an election, they're going to spend taxpayer money, they're going to deal with all the litigation from the company, they want to know it's worth their time. So I think that as companies like Amazon become more commonplace and their like business model of high turnover uh, is more common, uh, the board kind of needs to modernize a little and have alternative ways of recognizing when there's interest in a workplace for a union election because in our situation it's very hard for us as you know worker organizers, we're a worker-led union to take on a company as big as Amazon with the resources that they have and the you know they don't care about the law at all so the illegal union busting that they do um, they need to be able to find a way to, to work with us workers, which is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to protect workers um, and, and help us through the process when there's interest for a union election. Work with us to, you know, on good faith. We're trying to demonstrate that and, you know, not stick so much to the 30 percent threshold because, you know, it's, it's impossible. Nobody's really had a lot of success with that, not the RWDSU and not the Teamsters either. And, you know, the 10,000 workers that they're churning through, basically hiring and firing in a year, that's quite different than the TV commercials with the rainbows and sunshines. Yeah. I keep seeing this one commercial with this guy who, I don't know, Amazon put him through school, nursing school, and now he's a nurse. And the commercial ends with him on the beach, like happy, looking at the, ra looking at the sun. I mean, what you're describing is a lot different. It just seems like a, basically like a hamster wheel, yeah. uh, just hire, fire, hire, fire. Yeah, and it's funny because when Amazon uh, comes to build a warehouse in a community, they boast, you know, we're going to create X number of jobs. Here they say, you know, we're going to build, we're going to create 10,000 jobs. Um, it's going to be great for the community. But if you are creating a job where the worker stays on average four months and every year you churn through 10,000 people, you're not really creating jobs and you're not helping the community. You're sapping energy out of the community to create profit. And so that's why when Amazon comes in these communities and offers to build a warehouse, really what is happening is they're making a deal with the devil and uh, it's cr creating more instability in the community than anything. And so, you know, that guy on the beach, whatever, he's that hasn't been the experience of most people who come to work for Amazon.